Hello and welcome to Socialism, the weekly Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. What are the lessons for today from the 1926 general strike? One of the myths around the British working class is that it's too ponderous and conservative to have a serious fight with capitalism. But actually, centuries of bitter class struggle have shown the real potential again and again. But arguably, the high point came in 1926, during a period of national and international crisis for capitalism not so different from today. Despite the hesitancy and treachery of the official union leaders, Britain's workers came out on strike in every sector, and without an end date. They even started running parts of society for themselves. How did Britain's only general strike so far come into being? What did it show us about the revolutionary power of a general strike? And why did it end in defeat? And what can workers and socialists learn for the huge class battles coming up today? This episode of Socialism looks at Britain's almost revolution, the 1926 general strike. We're joined today by international man of mystery, Lenny Shale, a member of the National Committee of the Socialist Party and an organiser in the West Midlands. So we're talking about the general strike in Britain in 1926. It's the only real general strike that Britain has had so far. What was it? Why was it important? Thanks, James. Well, first of all, yeah, the 1926 general strike really, in terms of the British working class, is the most momentous event, the greatest event that the British working class has taken part of, where for nine days in May 1926, really, they shook the foundations of British capitalism. There was the potential for a revolutionary situation. And really, for us as Marxists and socialists, there's numerous lessons from the strike, from how you relate to trade unions and the ways that the working class can move into action. But also, just in those nine days, the initiative, the role, the working class, the methods they used to really challenge the foundations of British capitalism, where just in nine days, really, an element of a dual power existed, where the working class, in effect, began to run society to an extent themselves in many areas of Britain, and just in nine days. Now, there's many lessons from it, how it was defeated, that we'll go into But for us as Marxists, it's a key period of history for us to look at. So why did this kick off in 1926? What was going on that led to it? Well, obviously, it took place only seven years after the ending of World War I. Now, I know in the previous podcast, Alistair Tice, in episode 75, touched on in lots of detail, really, the events from 1919 to 21, Black Friday in 1921. But that whole period, the crisis of British capitalism that existed led to huge amounts of industrial unrest, movements by the working class, but also you can't neglect the international situation, the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, the effect on that, on the movement to the working class in all areas of the world, the mutinies that took place after the end of the First World War in India, parts of Africa, and of course in Europe that really ended the First World War, which I know we've touched on in previous podcasts. But Britain wasn't absent from that. There was huge strike waves in 1919. In fact, there could have been general strikes in all of those years. In fact, really, in 1919, a massive movement erupted. The strikes by police, I mean, the previous podcast touched on, could this have been a revolutionary period in Britain? So that was the background to it. There have been numerous attempts to attack the miners, the most powerful battalions, if you like, of the British working class, particularly in terms of the strength of the miners' union, in terms of its size, its role it played in mining coal in terms of allowing British capitalism to flourish, which obviously had been nationalised during World War One. So there had been a massive attempt after World War One to take back control. The mine owners were determined to make the miners themselves pay for the crisis in their own industry. But of course, the miners' instinct was to fight. Now, there had been a defeat in 1921 on Black Friday where many of the other trade unions that had previously said they'd support the miners had failed to really come behind the miners. So there had been a defeat then, and the right-wing union leader of the miners at that point was later gotten rid of, and you had the replacement of a guy called A.J. Cook, who had previously been a member of the Communist Party, and I'll go into that later, but he was seen as a left-wing. He called himself a follower of Lenin. Now, as I'll go into later, he really wasn't a revolutionary, but nevertheless, he was a left leader, a fighter for the working class. And so you had the emergence of some left-wing trade union leaders who were determined they were going to fight for their class in the upcoming battles that begin to take place in that period. And part of the lead-up was, in 1925, something called Red Friday. How did that play into the events? Well, of course, so this had been going on going for a period of time, and the Tory government was determined to 
will make the whole of the working class pay for the crisis. They've been in a deflationary period. And like any capitalist class, they make the working class pay for their own misdoings and problems. So in 1925, the Tory government had launched, like they often do, an inquiry to look at how to deal with this situation. Now, they fully realised that the working class was a powerful force and they wanted to buy themselves some time. It's a tactic the ruling class have used throughout history. We saw it with Thatcher in the 1980s. It stocked up stores of coal. We were understanding she was going to go on the attack later on. So, in so Red- this was with the idea of actually provoking a strike but having the supplies there so that you could defeat the strike and try to break the union. Exactly. So faced with this powerful, embattled working class, the Tory government bought themselves time on Red Friday. They proposed a nine-month subsidy to the coal industry. So, in effect, the government was paying the mine owners to carry on paying the same wages to the miners because they were determined to bring down the wages. And a slogan emerged at this period by A.J. Cook, not a penny off the pay, not an hour on the day. That was the sort of main slogan of the miners. They were determined they weren't going to accept this. And the government realised this and they thought, right, we'll buy ourselves time. Now, at the time, ironically, the government had a massive outlash from the right wing press. They were seen as weak. But of course, the government, they were preparing for a showdown. Now, they predicted what was possibly going to take place. The sad fact is the leaders of the unions didn't prepare in no way the same way as the government. In fact, they were later caught out. So what were the unions doing during that time then? Well, sadly, many of the union leaders were not just reformists, but really characters that were determined to carry on with the status quo. They had no determination or no desire, really, to change society in the interests of the working class soever. And really, this had been teased out in 1919, when this whole situation really began to emerge between the miners, the ruling class, and the rest of the working class that stood firm behind the miners. Because even in 1919, Prime Minister David Lloyd George at the time... So this was the Liberal Prime yeah, Minister. Yeah, the Liberal Prime Minister represented a big business, declared to the trade union leaders when it, the first talks about the post-war period that pay for miners. He said, look, a general strike had been threatened at that point. At that point, there was a thing called the Tripart Alliance between the strongest trade unions, the railway workers, the TNG and the miners. And they had an agreement if one was going to go on strike, the rest would come out. The TNG, that's the Transport and General Workers Union. Yeah, which became what we know as Unite today. Yeah. And Lloyd George said to the miners in a meeting, look, gentlemen, and I'm quoting Lloyd George here, so it's not my language, <laughs> if you carry out your threat and strike, you will defeat us. But if you do so, have you weighed the consequences? The strike will be in defiance of the government of the country and its very success will precipitate a constitutional crisis of the first importance. For if a force arises which is stronger than the state itself, then it must be ready to take on the functions of the state or withdraw and accept the authority of the state. Gentlemen, have you considered, and if you have, are you ready? And really what Lloyd George is summing up there is what we Marxists understand is the role of an all-out general strike, that fundamentally it challenges power. It questions who actually controls society. So a situation exists where either the working class goes forward takes power and begins to reorganise society on a democratic socialist basis, as we would argue, or the official leaders and the working class retreat. And sadly, if a party doesn't exist or an organisation doesn't exist that could challenge that, the working class is defeated. And sadly, the miners knew that. I think there's a quote from one of the miners' leaders after that. He said, look, after Lloyd George said that to us, we knew we were defeated. Well, so hang on, Lloyd George wrote to the union leaders... This is a meeting. In a, meeting. In a, meeting. Yeah, a meeting. He spoke to them in a meeting and dared them to overthrow the government, saying that they could do it, and they said, no thanks. Yeah, so they had no understanding, no confidence in their own class. And sadly, at the time, there had been many people warning that a strike was on the cards. Leon Trotsky, who was engulfed in a huge battle on his own in Russia at the time, only a few years before had launched the left opposition was in a battle against the stalification, the bureaucratisation of the Communist Party in Russia. Now, the Communist Party in Russia had been advising the Communist Party in Britain. Mm-hmm. They'd also set up a thing called the Anglo-Russian Committee, which was, in effect, a link-up between the Russian trade unions and the British trade unions. Now, because of that sort of bureaucratic relationship, the advice that was coming from the common turn, the Third International, the international body that the Communist parties in Russia and other parts of the world were joined into was... Look, you've got to put your faith in these, not only the soft lefts, like A.J. Cook and Purcell, who was the leader of the furniture trade unions, and Swales, who was the leader of the engineer union. They were seen as the sort of three lefts on the TUC General Council. 
not only put your faith in them, but put your faith in the right wing. Obviously, they didn't say the right wing, but put your faith in the leaders because they're friends of us now on the Anglo-Russian committee. And they had no understanding of the situation that was taking place. And Trotsky was warning, look, when this subsidy ends after Red Friday, in nine months' time, in May 26, a showdown's going to take place. He predicted a general strike. But the union leaders were blind to the situation taking place. If you read the documents, the bulletins, the reports coming out beforehand, even the Workers' Weekly, the Communist Party at the time, there was even an article, I think, nine days before a strike that a revolution is, in effect, not on the cards. They had no <laughs> understanding of what was taking place. Only Trotsky, writing from Russia, was advising, putting forward what was taking place. And if you read Where Is Britain Going, he touches on a whole number of these issues. So it was the first committee meeting of the TUC that took place. The General related, Council. The General Council, related to the strike, took place only a few days before while the government had been pairing for months on end. Now, you mentioned that the Anglo-Russian Committee, this was a link-up between the Russian and the British trade unions, but you said it was bureaucratic, i.e. it was really from the top, from the union machines. What do you mean by that exactly? How did that work? Because clearly an international linking up of trade unions, socialists would see as a good thing in general. Yeah, and obviously as socialists we would often support that. I think the Anglo-Russian Committee had actually been set up in the aftermath of the Russian-Polish war, where there'd been a threat of strike action by the British trade unions if Britain was to go on the attack against Russia or supply arms and so on. So obviously we would support that. But the process that were taking place in Russia at the time was being reflected to the workers' movement and the communist movement in other parts of the world, where as Stalin sort of slowly bureaucratised seized control of the state bureaucracy, if you like, in Russia, that you saw the slow bureaucratisation of the system. That was again being replicated as these international link-ups, rather than become a cog for revolutionary movements abroad, became a cog to stabilise the bureaucracy in Russia. Mm. And it linked up with Stalin's idea of socialism in one country. In effect, Stalin wasn't after a revolution in Britain. He didn't really want that. He wanted a bureaucracy to stabilise Russia and build up those links. And of course, I might touch on it later, that we have to remember that the 1926 general strike reflected some of the best elements of the British working class, its traditions, the initiative to take action, to move into action, to organise. The British working class is the oldest working class in history. Its traditions, its structures go back about 100 years before 1926. And so the structure, the bureaucracy of trade unions, the statesmen of trade unions that existed, assumed very powerful positions. Within the capitalist system. Within the capitalist system. Many of the leaders of the right-wing unions had cosy relationships with the capitalist class. The stories of Jimmy Thomas, the leader of the Railway Workers Union, having a seat in the Royal Box at Ascot and (laughs) cosy relationships. Now, that didn't have to be the case. I will slag off the Communist Party, the role it played, but when I say the Communist Party, really, we're talking about the leadership of the Communist Party and the mistakes they made in following Stalin's line, the line from Moscow. Now, we have to remember that the rank and file of the Communist Party existed tremendous fighters, class fighters, who actually, in the local areas, went further, ignored the advice from the top. And actually, in 1924, they established an organisation called the National Minority Movement, that at its height had over a million and a quarter members, nearly 25% of the TUC membership were supporters of the National Minority Movement. Now, this is a body that was a genuine rank and file body, they're organised on a rank-and-file basis in workplaces, in local branches that wanted to both push the official trade union leaders but also push come to shove at some stage, move into unofficial action, move into its own action as well. And, of course, that had the potential to play a momentous role. But sadly, because of the leadership of the Communist Party, who put the faith in the right-wing leaders, who pays no criticism of these leaders, because of the relationship in the Anglo-Russian Committee, they weren't going to call them out on anything because th- there was this cosy relationship with Russia. Mm. So and in the end... The, they there was a cosy relationship yeah. between the Russian increasingly Stalinised bureaucracy and the bureaucracy at the top of the British trade unions, which in turn had a cosy relationship with the capitalist establishment in Britain. Exactly. So under the cover of, you know, oh, well, this is... Uh, we are the defenders of the Russian Revolution, says the Anglo-Russian Committee, but in fact they were cover for defence of the capitalist status quo in Britain. Yeah, increasingly so, and ultimately that's what allowed the capitalist class to gain the upper hand later on in the strike. OK, so we'll come back to talk about the national minority movement, which 
was organising from below among the more militant ranks in contradistinction to the Anglo-Russian committee organising at the top to really hold the establishment together in effect. But let's just examine in a little bit more detail the actual components of the TUC and the different union leaders. Is it the case that all the unions were the same? No, not at all. I mean, and this is the irony, there's always been a contradiction in the trade unions. So, so like the National Union Railway at the time was led by a right winger called Jimmy Thomas, who I touched on, matey with King George at the time, <laughs> who was determined to do whatever he could to avoid a strike. Up until the day the strike started, was doing his best to appeal to Stanley Baldwin, look, We'll do whatever we can to avoid this. Baldwin was the Tory Prime Minister yeah, at the time. Um, you also had Walter Citrin, the TUC General Secretary, another right winger. But I mean, the irony is, in today's context, they're probably seen as moderate. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, they were seen as right wing. They were determined to avoid the strike at any possibility. But because of this, they sat on a membership that was radicalised. The process that we've touched on internationally in Britain, in their eyes, they were letting off steam. We have to like get rid of this steam, like get out, just so we can everyone can go back to work later. The union leaders, you yeah, mean, the right, yeah. Steam. So while the right wing leaders, who had again a cosy relationship with the leader of the Labour Party at the time, Ramsay Macdonald, who was doing everything he could to avoid a showdown between the classes to keep capitalism going, but the leader of the NUM, AJ Cook, had been a member of the Communist Party but had left in 1921 because even by the early 20s, you're beginning to see the bureaucratisation of the Communist Party in Russia and knock-on effect on Communist parties around the world. And they'd supported, in effect, the agreement that led to Black Friday, which was a big defeat for the miners, the first time they came for the miners. But sadly, the Communist Party supported that, the leadership, and AJ Cook had resigned in protest at that. He still remained a left, mm. often quoted Lenin, seeing himself as a Leninist. But he was an individual. He wasn't a revolutionary or a Marxist as we know in terms of understanding the confidence in the working class. No doubt a class fighter, tremendous respect. But in terms of his understanding and confidence in how the working class could take power, he lacked that decisiveness and programme and organisation. A romanticised socialist revolution, if that makes sense, Mm. rather than a determined class fighter that would take power Mm. when the opportunity arose. Mm. Now, others that were even softer than him Purcell, who's the leader of the Furniture Trade Union, and Swales, the leader of the Engineers Union, they were really seen as the main lefts on the TUC General Council. The rest were either right-wing or just happy to carry on with the status quo. They got themselves in the comfortable positions in that period. OK, so none of the union leaders was particularly good. Some of them were better than others, however, in the TUC General Council. But if the leaders of the unions were <laughs> at best unreliable, how did the general strike even happen? Well, as I said before, the capitalist class had bought off the unions, the working class, for nine months. And Trotsky, in this whole period, is warning them in his writings, writing from Russia, look, a showdown's going to take place. That The situation British capitalism exists is that they're going to try and attempt to get the miners out of the way, then they can go for the rest of the working class, get the most powerful unions out of the way. And this is interesting because the ruling class, despite making preparations, and we've often said the Tory party throughout history has often been the most far-sighted organisation. It's an organisation that wants rule over a third of the world. And it thought it was far-sighted. It had judged these trade union leaders, as Lloyd George had found out in 1919. They haven't got the guts to take us on. They haven't got the initiative or the programme to replace capitalism. So we'll go for them. But the mistake they made is they took the lack of planning, the lack of understanding, the lack of confidence, the lack of initiative or desire to fight for their class of the trade union leaders they mistook that as a representative of the british working class themselves Mm. as a body and a working class were a determined force this is a class that had come back from world war one they'd suffered years of attacks and when the subsidy ended government and the mine owners came for the miners trying to cut their pay force them to work longer hours the working class said we ain't having any of that and they came out in their millions and that's why it took place. They misjudged the competence and the mood of the leadership for the mood and competence of the class. Mm. And the class was far more ahead of the leadership themselves. So the National Minority Movement was an important component in this, is that right? Yeah. And the National Minority Movement, despite being an extremely positive body which had a lot of roots in important parts of the trade union rank and file, which included some of the better left reformists in most cases, but some revolutionaries as well, activists and organisers, it made important mistakes also, didn't it? 
Yes, it gathered really the most combative element to the trade unions. And it's ranked, I think I said before, over a million and a quarter members, really, including in terms of its supporters. Its conferences are huge. Even its programme, in terms of what it was fighting for, it called for nationalisation of the mining industry with no compensation, with full workers' control. It gathered those best elements of the rank and file, the ones that were looking at what had taken place in the Russian Revolution. But sadly, but again, because of, it was set up by the Communist Party, it was like the Communist Party sort of trade union initiative, it was held back, constrained by the programme and the position of this young Communist Party that had fantastic rank and file fighters within its ranks. It could have played the role of gathering the best elements that could have both pushed the bureaucracy further but also on the ground, organised the type of committees, bodies that were necessary that could have taken initiatives when ultimately the right wing and the soft left would retreat and in effect betray the workers they represented. But because it had taken advice from Stalin and Russia, Mm. even before the strike, it didn't play that role it could have in terms of assuming the role of organisation in local areas that wasn't taking place from the top in the TUC leadership. So again, from the very beginnings, it was hobbled by the role of increasingly bureaucratised, Stalinized Communist Party that had great potential, but was hobbled from the start. OK, so there were problems in the foundations of the strike movement. Nonetheless, the anger and confidence of the working class itself in Britain, despite the misgivings of its leaders, led to an outbreak of a general strike. Once it started, how far did it develop? Now... As I said, the government had misjudged. They'd seen the mood of the leadership and thought that represented the working class and how wrong they were. The working class saw no alternative but to strike. On the first day, despite all the preparations of the bosses and the government, it came to nothing against this colossal response. It was a actually momentous response. In the first few days, millions came out and each day the strike drew stronger. And within each day you could see the confidence of the working class gain as they began to challenge the foundations of capitalism. And I think there's a good quote from a sheet metal worker. There's lots of reports you can read about the strike, which are fantastic. I'll encourage anyone to just read. It gives you a sense of just what took place in those nine days. And he said, look, employers of labour were coming, i.e. the bosses, cap in hand, begging for permission to do certain things, to allow their workers to return to perform certain customary operations. Most of them were turned away empty, I thought of many occasions when I had turned empty away from the door of some workshop in a weary struggle to get the means to purchase the essentials of life for self-independence. In effect, the bosses were now coming to the working class and begging for, oh, can we move this bit of transportation? Can we move these goods or can we distribute these foods? And it was the working class and local areas that were deciding for themselves how society should be run. And what assumed organisation was councils of action, Often these were bodies that emerged from local trades councils. Trades councils are the union branches in a particular local area coordinating together. Yeah, Yeah, and luckily many of these, despite the role of the leadership that gave no real leadership or sense of how to organise, these bodies, and it gives a glimpse really about the initiative, the ability of the working class to give a sense of the situation and direction of what is needed to organise in the current situation. And some of the stories are quite fantastic, how these councils of action assume local organisation. In many areas, you would have signs up saying no right of way without permission from the local strike council of action. In effect, you had workers' control in large parts of the country. There's some of the reports and stories you hear, like the electricity board would have to go to the local strike committee and say, are we allowed to put electricity on? And it was a local strike committee that would decide whether, yeah, we would, but so they got our permission. Mm. And of course, in those nine days, things did still go on. Hospitals still ran, things still ran, but it was done with permission of the TUC, i.e. it wasn't scab working. And when, when was, you say the TUC, you don't mean the National see, TUC? Yeah, sorry, the local tr- councils of action, yeah, sorry. Local councils of action strike committees, they would organise pickets of major workplaces. Most of the railways, transportation came to a halt in most parts of the country, the only transportation that took place was scab labour, organised often by fascists, by middle-class students that were recruited by Churchill and the ruling class. But the only other transportation was official strike transportation. And it's hard to describe just how organised these bodies were. And I don't like often quoting, but like just give a sense, as often each strike committee would organise various subcommittees to deal with all the different things, because in effect they were running society. Mm. And just to give an example, this is from the Coventry Council of Action, 
they organise separate committees, one for distress, relief, class war, prisoners' aid, one for entertainment and socials, a committee for finance, a committee for food and prices, a committee for meetings and propaganda, a committee for office staff, a committee for organisation, a committee for permits, a committee for pickets and rota, like work out the rota of the pickets, a committee to deal with the police and defence court, a committee for public committees, a committee for public information, intelligence, literature and press publications, committees for research, a committee for sports, a committee for transport, dispatch, messengers, lines of communication, a committees for vital services and committees for women. Now that's just commentary. <laughs> Like, I mean, some of the others are even more outlandish. There's a, I've got a whole, there's a whole diagram people can't see on the podcast of working out how these committees would work. This is the Myrtle Trades Council and Labour Council Council of Action in East Fife. I think it's about 16, 17 different committees, which then went to subcommittees. Now, this but is just this nine is days. What, this is what Lloyd George was warning about seven years before. If you have a force which is more powerful than the capitalist state in that case, it has to take on the functions of the state. So you had, in effect, a kind of embryonic worker state in those local areas. Exactly. And this is everything the right-wing trade unions were fearing, that on the ground, the working class were every day gaining confidence. They were now, the bosses were coming begging to them and they were in charge. They were running society. Now, of course, it wasn't the case everywhere and the ruling class were very, very scared at this point. I touched on earlier in the nine months, Churchill had been, in effect, tasked with organising a scab army of labour. In London, particularly, they'd been using students from Oxford and Cambridge. So he was Churchill's, what, the Home Secretary at this home time? Home Secretary, Winston Churchill. He's been <laughs> on the news a lot. Not only a racist, but also, as we've often commented, a person who hated the working class, spent most of his life attacking the working class. And he was in charge of that scab armies of labour that organised amongst the black shirts, the sort of fascist representatives in Britain middle-class students to try and keep elements of society going. But ultimately, in many parts of the country, they failed. In, in some parts, there were attacks by them against picket lines. Some areas had to organise defence committees. The army was even on call, ready to be used. Embarrassingly for the British state, there was even a situation where they put a warship, a submarine, ready to be used to go up at time, and they were forced to retreat because the local strikers pointed out all the health and safety measures that were being broken. They threatened to take even more action, so they were forced to retreat on that basis. So <laughs> the capitalist class in many parts of the country were utterly embarrassed. There were even stories in many parts of the country where elements of uh, defence groups were being organised to defend against attacks both by the police but also against right-wing groups. I mean, this is another point, the lack of organisation, not a positive aspect, that in the run-up to the strike, many of the leaders of the Communist Party, the offices of the Communist Party and the Workers Weekly, the printing press, had been shut down, arrested, while in local areas there'd been action taken to defend those people, to get them out of prison. Nationally, there was nothing really done about that. Now, I touched on how the state wasn't neutral in this. The state came in, the police, the army, was all being mobilised to use against the working class but also unafraid to rely on fascist groups as exactly. well. This is Winston Churchill. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. They were ready to lean on, if necessary, on those types of people. But you also began to see fracturing in the state. Now, not on a big scale. These are more reports from local areas, but it does give a glimpse. This dual power that was now existing, when I say dual power, there was the Tory government in London that sat over British capitalism, sat over Britain, but emerging locally with these councils of action that was beginning to side society amongst themselves. Now, sadly, it wasn't national, it wasn't being linked up enough. But these were elements of a pre-revolutionary situation, but there were also elements of fracturing and splits within the state. Now, this isn't pictured everywhere, but there are stories of local areas where the police came out in support. No, not everywhere. Some areas, the police were used as a battering ram against the pickets. We can't ignore that. There's, I know there's reports in Lincoln where the local constable came to the picket line, the strike council of action, and said, well, you're running things now. You're in charge of the police now. <laughs> and so in Lincoln... The local police force was an official council of action police force. In effect, it was there to go by the decision making a local council of action. Now, that happened in a few other areas, but you can't say that's replicated nationally. But it just gives a glimpse about how things could have developed and the splits that emerges within elements of this state. But yeah, that's just one of the stories. And there are many of these stories and reports. There was some gathering of amazing reports after the strike about some of these things that took place. So the response to the capitalist class was to throw everything it could to try and break the strike. The military, the police, fascist groups, mobilising middle-class students. It's hard to imagine, by the way. Black shirts or middle-class students being a factor in a general strike situation in Britain today. But 
you also had embryonic worker states or the components of an embryonic worker state developing in a lot of local areas through the strike committees. You had the actual forces of the state in some areas starting to become unreliable for the capitalists. Could this have been the end of British capitalism? Yes, it could have been, I think. And as you touched on, James, there were elements of a pre-revolutionary situation. The embryos of dual power beginning to emerge. What do you mean by dual power? A dual power. You have Stanley Baldwin's Tory government that was supposedly running society, but actually on the ground, it was workers running society. So in those nine days, the question is beginning to arise amongst the class. Well, actually, who is running society? Mm. Is it the capitalist class? Or is it these councils of action that haven't become officially a different body of power, but are beginning to play that role? So in that sense, yes, that represented the possibility for a revolutionary situation. But crucially, what really was missing was a Marxist, a working class revolutionary party that had the programme that could have linked those things together, that could have gave the demands, the slogans, the programme, that could have gave realisation to this embryo that was developing locally. Now, we touched on the Communist Party before. The Communist Party was still a fairly small, a young party, Many of its rank and file members were playing the role of beginning to develop these local councils of action. But from the top, from the leadership, you had the main slogan was all power to the general council of the TUC. <laughs> yeah, the main slogan was all power to the general council, as in the general council of the TUC. Now, this is a body that hadn't been preparing, was doing everything it could from the very start of the strike to do a deal with Bolwin to halt the strike. It didn't want the strike to carry on. Yet, to the very day the strike was called off, the Communist Party had this slogan, all power to the General Council. And if you read some of their daily bulletins coming out from the Communist Party, there was no talk of, say, link up the local councils of action. Mm. All power to the strike councils of action. Which are the been, ones which were actually yeah, running they're the strike, the ones the meetings to link up those uh, bodies, a delegate body conference to bring together all these councils of actions to decide a centralised national way forward. Instead, all power to the TUC. And their only political slogan was for a Labour government. If you read their daily bulletins, not what type of Labour government, let's remember, you have Ramsay MacDonald at the very heart, no programme or demands in terms of what sort of policies that government should pursue in terms of nationalisation, workers' control or so on. The simple slogan, all power... breaking up the capitalist state. Yeah, no, yeah. This was a state that just in nine days is beginning to shake. No demands in terms of linking what was taking place locally to take that strike forward. And so it's really a continuation of what they've been saying before. This false illusion in a general council was a body that was representing the working class. So sadly, yes, though it was a pre-revolutionary situation, that vital ingredient of a revolutionary party, a leadership that could have given a sense of direction, that both had the confidence in what the working class was beginning to pursue, but also a realistic understanding of where the strike was, it just wasn't there, sadly. So in order for the working class to have achieved victory in the general strike, which actually would have meant overthrowing the capitalist state, that was the situation which they were posed with, it would have required the coming together of a revolutionary party rooted in the working class, which wasn't taking advice from the Kremlin, looking after its increasingly narrow bureaucratic interests. It wasn't taking advice from the General Council of the TUC, looking after ultimately the interests, in fact, of British capitalism, but was basing itself on the real committees of action and putting forward a raft of policies to link those committees of action together and to take the industrial and the political and state power out of the hands of the capitalists for good, to transfer it to the workers, to implement a workers' state and a publicly owned planned economy under the democratic control of the working class. That kind of organisation was necessary. But you add the Communist Party, which you say was small, but did have thousands of members at the time, and as you've remarked, had some of the best worker militants in its ranks. You had the National Minority Movement, which brought together some of the most combative elements in the trade unions. Why weren't they able to come up with that and lead it to victory? Yeah, I mean, there was huge opportunities for the Communist Party in that point. Despite being small, that was in no way is an excuse for how it could have played a role. The Bolsheviks only had 8,000 members at the start of the February Revolution in 1917, mm. rapidly grew in that period because it had the correct slogan in the man's. It didn't seem much, but bread, peace and land. Understood the situation, Lenin's slogan in that period. The Communist Party, despite being small, it could have been armed with those slogans in the man's. It was only Trotsky the lone voice from Russia that was really, for months before, was saying, look, a showdown's coming, yeah. we're going to have to... He was advising, look, we can't have this position of 
False Illusions in the Leadership and the Anglo-Russian Committee is a body that would do anything to represent the class. The National Minority Movement had the structures in place, the support in place, that if armed with the correct strategy to argue that the councils of action should step up the strike, step up their levels of organisation, coordinate it nationally, rather than retreat from the bosses, actually go on the attack, take greater steps in terms of implementing its own control on distribution, goods, on how society was running, rather than almost let things carry on up in the air, if you like. But the Communist Party just didn't have any of that programme. I think it's interesting, I mean, on the internet these days you can read some of the daily bulletins coming out from the Communist Party, the British Worker, which was like the daily bulletin from the TUC. And it's often, it's full of stories about, in effect, trying to, we're not after changing anything, we're just after sorting out the miners' dispute. But they completely failed to understand that the workers had come out in support of the miners. But Trotsky makes a point, appetite increases with eating. Mm. The working class, we're in a colossal showdown with the ruling class. As I touched on that quote before, the steel sheet worker, the bosses were coming to them. Mm. They were in a powerful position. If they'd been armed with a programme, a revolutionary party that provided the leadership, a programme, what was needed, the political tasks that were needed, like you've touched on, nationalisation, taking control of all the means of production, taking control of the factories, organising and running them on the basis of need, not profit, mm. it could have inspired the working class to actually say, no, we're going to go back on our terms, we'll run them, and the bosses, you're locked out. Yeah, um, You could have had those steps, but it didn't. It was nothing apart from all power to the General Council. And of course, from day one, the General Council was doing everything it could to stop the strike, trying to get Stanley Baldwin to come to the table. And as the strike increased, it was doing everything it could even further to try and stop it because they were scared of what was taking place. They didn't want to challenge capitalism. They wanted to go back to their cosy little relationships and rest on their bureaucracy. So it was really a question of political leadership and strategy. Exactly, yeah. How did the strike end? So, as I said before, James, from day one, the TUC General Council have been trying to stop the strike, particularly the right-wing leaders, Walter Sitchin, General Secretary of the TUC, Jimmy Thomas, the Railway Workers Leader. Of course, they didn't represent the mass membership of their unions. The membership of their unions had gone out in their thousands and millions. Well, yeah, in fact, in spite of the TUC, the strike the, started over the head of the TUC, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. So they'd been doing everything they could. And on the 12th of May, nine days into the strike, and this is a, the ultimate sabotage, without any agreement, no attempt to secure safety or no retaliation agreements, i.e. the bosses, if the strike ended, to come back on the attack on workers for striking, picketing and so on. Without any agreement, they called off the strike. And did that work? Because the workers had gone on strike without the TUC say so. Why should they listen to the TUC if it says go back in? Well, they thought it might work. <laughs> for them, they'd let off the steam. But reality is, as you touched on, it didn't work whatsoever. Actually, two or three days after, more workers came out <laughs> on the strike. And many of them just didn't accept that they could have done that. And this is, again, that because of lack of leadership, it was left to uh, individual workers to slowly went back to work. And then you had an ultimate backlash from the ruling class. In effect, that sabotage from the TUC was paid for. The reward for the working class was hunger, unemployment, victimisations of the most militant workers. Many of the leaders, organisers of the Communist Party were still locked up. Many of the organisers were imprisoned. Mm. But nothing was done by the General Council. And this is the irony. The Communist Party put all its faith in this body that Trotsky had warned about that would sell out the strike. There's a Communist Party bulletin that came out a few days after the strike. And it's almost, it's in shock. How could the TUC General Council do this to us? <laughs> and you're thinking, are you, are you going, seriously? It's like, that, you, it's like that meme, isn't it? With the guy shooting yeah, the guy on the couch <laughs> and then going, oh, how could he do this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, this has been going, you would have known this in 1919, seven years before, but... They just had no perspective about the processes taking place. So sadly, yes, it was a defeat and a heavy defeat for that. So it was a heavy defeat. What were the consequences then? Well, the, the miners continued to strike. The miners' strike continued for a number of months. But again, ultimately, they were defeated. Um, wages were cut, increased working hours. It's a sad ending to really what was a momentous event. But was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it. Despite... The backlash, despite the um, counter-attacks from the ruling class, in those nine days, the experience gained for the British working class was historical, really. And that's why it's so important we still talk about it. It's why you don't learn about it in school. Because this was the nine days when British capitalism was shook to its very foundations. In those nine days, the British working class had a taste of ruling society for themselves. The closest, really, Britain 
has ever come to a revolutionary situation. And the fact is, we've never had a general strike since. We've come close to it in 1972 with the Pentaville Dockers dispute. And even after the strike, there could have been opportunities for the Communist Party to grow, to at least sort of make the most of the mistakes they'd made by calling out the Anglo-Russian Committee, calling out the role of the TUC General Council, making a call that now we need to organise a national minority movement. But they didn't do that. Mm. Again, because the processes that were taking place internationally. In 1926, you also saw the defeat of the Chinese Revolution mm. because of mistakes by Stalin at the Kuomintang, the capitalist body, walked into Shanghai and Beijing and slaughtered thousands and thousands of workers and trade unions that, again, Trotsky had warned against. And so that process, again, was taking place and was <coughs> even to accelerate even further in the British Communist Party. So things could have been even made from that short period, but nevertheless, it was worth it. And I think there's a story in the TUC that took place in September after the strike, when a young miners delegate got up and said, look, we will have another general strike without you, and we will win next time. I think that just gives a glimpse that, yes, although it was a defeat, the lessons, the legacy of that strike, the people that took part in that were hugely radicalised. This was a generation that many of them would later go on and go to Spain to fight against Franco, fighting for what they thought was a socialist cause. Sadly, I can't go into detail on that, was being sabotaged again by Stalin. This was a generation that was determined to fight for their class, and the Communist Party still grew after 1926 because of that radicalised effect. So what are the lessons then for today? Well, for today, there's still huge, crucial lessons. I mean, the tactic of a general strike. The general strike is the ultimate weapon of the working class. And as Marxists, we are always careful how we use the tactic and the weapon of a general strike. When we call for it, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Now, we've called the Socialist Party, since the Tory government, the condemned government in 2010, there have been times when we've called for a general strike of a limited character, a 24-hour general strike. Because a 24-hour general strike... It's not the same as an all-out general strike. It gives a taste of the sort of power that exists in the working class, but it doesn't challenge power in a sense of what an all-out general strike does. But ultimately, it's still a fantastic weapon in giving an expression, giving workers a sense of the power that they do hold. I mean, James, you would have taken part in November 2011, was it? When, November um, 30th, 2011, yeah. Exactly, when that. it wasn't... Which was a de facto general strike, but only in the public sector. Exactly. And I remember being in Coventry that day and walking out in the city centre and every street had two or three picket lines outside civil service office, job centre, tax office, every single council building, a picket line, even the police station because of police civilian civilian staff. staff. The city centre was under workers' control to an extent. They ran, imagine that, times 10, 20. Mm. It gives a taste. Just 24 hours does that. But an all-out general strike is of a different scale. It has to be posed very carefully because, in effect, you're challenging power as we've touched on before. And the preparation, the programme that's needed has to be assessed and put into place ultimately. So in terms of the lessons, the lessons are that taste, a glimpse of what the British working class is capable of. We all know the stories. We're not like the French. The British (laughs) working class, we just say, yes, no, we get on with things. Well, 1926 shows the British working class has within itself the ability to take on the capitalist class and shake it to its very foundations. The British working class, the oldest working class, it's slow to move, but once it gets moving, it can be an almighty force that can challenge capitalism. Now, the general strike in the current period has often been misused by often trade union leaders. We've seen like the mm. our general strikes in Italy, France. We've often yeah. seen big general strikes in France, yeah. but they're of a... Or, 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 or even you've seen trade unions in France calling a general strike when they know there's not going to be a general strike. Yeah. They're just doing it to satisfy the activists. Exactly. It's seen as a letting off steam. For us as Marxists, a general strike is raising the question of power. And, and actually, you could it. look at Greece as well, couldn't you? Because you had a whole series of a number of years in Greece during the height of the austerity as a result of the persecution of the EU and the IMF, when the unions were calling 24-hour general strikes almost weekly for a period, when really they should have been going for an all-out general strike. So actually, it's not just, you know... It's wrong to call an all-out general strike if you haven't laid the groundwork. But when the time comes for an all-out general strike, it's wrong not to call one as well. Yeah, exactly, Jack. I think that Greece was a prime example. I remember at the time, big discussions about the general strike then. I think actually some of the stuff we've written was around that time because it raised the question of the tactics involved. And we raised the question of linking up those. And it has to come a point when the industrial weapon of the working class has to be linked with a political programme. And what was missing in Greece was, as was missing in twenty six as a revolutionary party that had that guidance, the confidence in the working class, but also the confidence in initiative to say, here's a programme that we need to link the political programme to this general strike to the question of power. 
and arm the working class with the tactics needed to challenge capitalism but also begin to organise society amongst itself. So a 24-hour general strike at a certain conjuncture in the life of the workers' movement in a given country, this can be a way to warm the class up, to help build up the confidence and the organisation of the class towards, you would hope, more militant action, maybe longer general strikes, potentially even an all-out general strike at a later stage. It's a preparatory step. The all-out general strike poses a question of power and so cannot be called for lightly. Actually, not in a 24-hour general strike. You have to call for it at the right moment. But suppose a situation arose in this day and age where an all-out general strike was taking place. And we've seen, for example, enormous revolts in Chile, in Hong Kong, Sudan and other countries which have included widespread strike action but haven't, in a lot of cases, had the kind of all-out general strike character where actually workers are starting to take control of society and end up in a situation of dual power. If, and in fact we would say when that situation arises in this day and age, what would dual power look like now? Well, I think often this question gets asked, you know, like, you couldn't have a revolution today, people are, you know, we often hear it. We're not the same, there's no blokes with flat caps, oily hands and pitchforks. <laughs> but in my opinion, actually, the processes that took place in 26 could be far more, actually easier in today's world. Look at the ways we have technology, the ways of communication, that natural instinct, look at how the protests around George Floyd sparked off around the world. The idea of people moving into action and solidarity, I think, is actually even more ingrained. Now, of course, there'd be even more difficulties, but still there are still fundamentals from 26 that are still crucial for us in terms of working class, democracy, accountability, the need for grassroots workplace organisation, which in the Socialist Party, the reason why we helped the National Shop Stewards Network was with a perspective that workplace organisation, rank and file organisation is going to be crucial in this period. The National Minority Movement potentially could have played, but I think in this period actually the processes of a general strike would be far more in favour of the working class because of that. But there are still fundamentals, the need for organisation and the role of a revolutionary party to help coordinate all of that and also put no illusions both in right-wing trade union leaders, soft left trade union leaders, but also in reformist politics. We still put demands, by the way, don't we? All the official trade union structures, we put demands for the TEC to call generalised action or coordinated action. Because actually, if it did do that, that would be a big step forward. It's got enormous resources, but even if it doesn't, it helps demonstrate the shortcomings of those leaders. Exactly, yeah. And I think actually we see every day the potential of actually how ordinary people can begin the initiative to organise amongst themselves. It's an element in the pandemic in the lockdown, how ordinary areas, communities began to distribute food to old people, people in need. That's not ruling society for themselves, but it gives a glimpse how that instinct of people to get together to organise what's needed is a party that can actually realise that and say, oh, imagine we did this nationally, begin to organise all the different vital functions in society on the basis of need and not profit. Just to summarise, I think we touched on today loads of different aspects of 1926. There's so much more. I'll encourage people to read 1926 General Strike, Workers Taste Power by Peter Taft, which I think is a fantastic insight into the build-up to the strike, the stories and reports of what took place. And it really, it almost sends shivers down your body when you look at some of the events that took place. Just it gives a taste of the ability of working people to organise society. Just in nine days, the working class gave a glimpse of that. Now, our task in the Socialist Party, we see it, is to learn the lessons from that. Point out mistakes in the Communist Party, but also point out the heroic role many young fighters played in that period. Point out the role Leon Trotsky played, the lone figure, really, who was engulfed in his own battle against Stalin and against the bureaucracy in Russia representing the left opposition that was really the only force given the correct strategy, the correct programme at the time. And we in the Social Party, that's our origins. We're the party that represents Trotsky and the left opposition. And really the only organisation today carrying on the legacy of that and pointing out the lessons of 1926 and the vital task today in remembering what took place, but also knowing the lessons that are going to be even vital in this period to come. Thanks very much for that, Lenny. And as always, if you like what you've heard... Recommend us to your co-workers and friends, donate to help fund us, and if you agree, join the Socialists. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for Workers International. Today we heard from Lenny Shale, speaking to James Ivans, and I'm Scott Jones. This episode was edited by Nick Hart. The Socialist event of the year will be Socialism 2020. It's an open forum of discussion and debate 
over four days from the 20th to 23rd of November. Join hundreds of socialists, trade unionists and working class fighters to discuss the way forward in this unprecedented crisis of capitalism. We're scheduling it online, but if in-person sessions become possible, you can upgrade your ticket nearer the time. Read more and book now at socialism2020.net. You can find further reading on this episode in the notes of your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. And if you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? Then we need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. And if you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Until next time, solidarity.